Africa's most famous presidents concedes defeat in a razor-thin election runoff. Liberia's George Weah is set to hand over power to his political rival Joseph Boakai. As Weah's presidency comes to an end, we'll look back at the political legacy of Africa's footballer president. What's next for the new president-elect and for the West African nation? Straight Talk Africa starts now. Hello there and a warm welcome to Straight Talk Africa. We're coming to you from VOA's headquarters in Washington. I'm Heidi Adams. It is Africa's oldest republic, founded by freed American slaves. Liberia, once ravaged by civil war, is seen today as a beacon of democracy in West Africa and the continent as a whole. The country has had its fair share of famous and infamous presidents, from ex-warlord Charles Taylor to Nobel laureate Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, to football hero turned president George Weah. King George, as he is known, came to office in 2018, embodying the promise of a young democracy and vowing to tackle the country's problems. But his presidency was marred by controversy and accusations that he failed to reduce poverty and fight corruption. Now, after one term and a hard-fought election, George Weah is preparing to leave office. David Doyle has more. Liberia's president, George Weir, conceded election defeat on Friday following a tight race for the presidency. And that means former vice president, Joseph Boakai, is set to take the reins. In a second round of voting, Boakai was leading with 50.9% on Friday, with nearly all the ballots counted. Votes obtained 814,212. That's a stark contrast to the last election in 2017, when global soccer legend Weir, buoyed by a wave of hope, trounced Boakai in the second round with 62%. But many have grown disillusioned with Weir since then, due to a lack of progress on his promises to stamp out corruption and raise living standards. Boakai's supporters danced in the streets on Friday night. I'm so glad today to tell Liberian people thank you very much. Boakai does, however, now inherit major national challenges. Poverty levels are high in a country still recovering from two civil wars and the Ebola epidemic that killed thousands. Shortly after results were announced, Boakai said, we have a job to do, but added that first and foremost, we want to have a message of peace and reconciliation. That message in a once volatile country was bolstered by Weir's concession. Speaking on the radio, he said that he had congratulated Boakai on his victory and that, I urge you to follow my example and accept the results. Those comments stand out in Western Central Africa, a region that has seen eight coups in three years and where elections are frequently contested in court amid accusations of fraud. Instead, the way has now been paved for Liberia's second democratic transfer of power in seven decades. The first being when we are swept to office six years ago. Well, joining me now is um, James Butty. He is the host and managing editor of VOA's radio show, Daybreak Africa. Um, James, so great to have you here. Thank you so very much for coming in and helping us understand exactly what is going on here. You know, sometimes in an election, James, you get an outcome that leaves even uh, the winner surprised. Um, what Was that the case for the man who is now poised to be Liberia's next president? Exactly. Uh, like many Liberians, I was also surprised because coming into the election, particularly the first round, I, I was looking at the opposition makeup and how divided the opposition was. And I was concerned. I said, well, because every time I speak to any, any of the opposition members, like Boakai himself, I will raise the question, how do you people hope to defeat an incumbent president when you're so splintered? And they were all counting on coming together in a runoff. Coming to the runoff, there was also a split. So uh, I, coming, I, I was concerned that they would not win. No, uh, George Weah was going to defeat them in the first round. 
And then the first round came, and I saw the results. Like many Liberians, I was shocked. And I was wondering, okay, so what happened? So I started to look at how it happened. Perhaps Boakai probably learned from his experience in the 2017 uh, election because he lost to George Weah. Right. And so uh, he had a very good team put together, powerful women working with him. He took the whole country. He did not concede any part of the country, including the western counties, the southeastern counties, the most populous counties in the West, Nimba County, Lofa County, his own county. Uh, he did not concede southeast where George Weah has his base. He competed in every he county. He went into the opposition's territory. He went there and competed. That's what he did. Yes. And we're seeing these kind of audacious, bold moves um, during elections. I think the same happened in Zimbabwe, too, where the opposition was really made a point of going into the ruling party stronghold. Of course, they did not prevail at the end of the day. But George Weir here says this is a time for graciousness in defeat, a time to place our country above party and patriotism above personal interest. He's been making headlines all over the place um, for the fact that he showed us what many are called sport, real sportsmanship here, that he did concede, especially, James, because this was such a razor-thin um, election for a sitting president to concede, make that call to his rival, um, even before the election results were, were announced. That's rare, not just in, in West Africa or in Africa. We've seen in the United States, too, those yes. calls are becoming, people are becoming much more reluctant to make those calls. Um, what, the fact that he didn't try to fight this outcome, what's the significance of that for Liberians in particular? I have been reading the papers, the news from all around the world, Africa particularly, even, even the African Union praising the decision by George Weah to concede. And uh, Liberians see that as a strength of their new democracy. And they hope that that is going to continue. Weah deserves uh, everyone's accommodation because there was a hope. People were thinking that, uh, because the election was too close, the right. results were very close, that he will contest, he will complain, and that his supporters will push him towards the country entering into a very unstable uh, climate. But uh, his decision to concede to Boaca is well praised for Liberia. Now it's time for Liberia to move forward and bring about a new chapter. And that will, but, but, but let me say that uh, we are probably contributed to his own defeat. I talk about Boaca, how he competed in every county, how he learned from his experience. But we are, uh, the, the economy of the country was very, very bad. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, did a, I, I did a story from Gallup poll. They did a poll, a survey of Liberians, 1,000 Liberians coming into the election. And I ran that interview on the day of the election on the October 4th, uh, October 10th. Um, they found that most Liberians, their biggest challenge coming into the election was the economy, that they could hardly find money to keep their families afloat. So what happened? How did we manage the economy? Did he just rely on his popularity as a celebrity to president? So that's what did him in. The economy, the uh, civil servants were not being paid. Coming into the election, three months behind. So everything put together, you would say, okay, maybe we are deserve to lose. And it's almost as if all of that overrided the fact that, um, you know, he was a celebrity president, as such all of us from the outside of the world, that, that's what we see. Um, tell us a little bit, James, we've got about two minutes or so, tell us a little bit about um, the president-elect, um, Joseph Boakai. He's a veteran politician, former vice president of Liberia. Well, what's his record and what is he saying will be his agenda going forward? Well, I mean, Liberian, first of all, uh, Liberians have been looking up to him. They, someone asked me, I think it was yesterday, last night, did the, did the uh, president-elect make a speech yet? Did he accept, did he make an acceptance? I said, no, no, I haven't heard that. Uh, but Boaka is a very humble person. Uh, you know, he served 12 years as pre vice president for Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Very humble. The last time I interviewed him, I've interviewed him regularly. The last time I interviewed him was in August here in Maryland. 
the first thing he asked me for was my well-being. I said, well, I came to talk to you, the presidential candidate, and you're asking me for how I am doing. I was, take, I said, well, thank you, Mr. Uh, Vice President, for asking for me. Um, but he's very humble. Somebody asked me, well, how come he doesn't talk? You, you don't hear him talk. I said, but that's his style. Everybody has a style. Very humble. Now he has a challenge. He has a challenge. And let's hope that he has learned from his experience as uh, 12 years of vice president that he can do well. There are many, many challenges that he has first to unite the country. Because as you mentioned, the election was very, very close. Now he has to bring the country together. Right. He has to choose a team. And to surround himself with a, a, a good team that will be willing to work for the Liberian people and not for themselves. What happened, Josh, we as uh, administration, uh, this is from my assessment, is that because we are, we are was, I think, ruling the country as a celebrity. He was not taking into account the people, his cabinet, what they were doing or what they were not doing. Right. And some people say, I, I was reading an editorial by the Daily Observer that perhaps he didn't like to make decisions. We did not like to make decisions. Um, and so everybody was doing their own thing. Everybody in the cabinet was doing their own thing. People, particularly the corruption. Uh, corruption, that people who did something wrong will find their way back into the system again, like a recycle. They will come back into the system. He had to make a decision. He should have made a decision to cut him out, but he did not. So let's hope that Boakai who has an experience, who is an experienced politician, Liberians are hoping. But I just hope that also he does not, he should speak to the people not to raise too much of expectations of mm. him. Because there's a lot that he has to accomplish. And, you know, as, as you say, the first, I've heard the first five years of being president, um, those are the difficult years. After that, it's smooth sailing. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you know, winning is one thing, then running the country Absolutely. is where the real challenge lies. James Butty, what a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you so it's very so much. It's so good to see you, Heidi. <laughs> same, same, same good to here. See you. Same here. Well, James is um, the, his radio show, Daybreak Africa. You'll find that every weekday. And uh, James is the host and managing editor. Stay with us. We're going to take a short break here. When we come back, we'll look at the legacy of Liberia's outgoing president, George Weir, and the challenges ahead for the incoming leader Joseph Boakai. Straight Talk Africa will be back in a moment. In times of change, when the world seems uncertain, and what we hear doesn't reflect what we see, we seek the truth. When we are told only part of the story, we lose trust. In moments of crisis, our dreams, hopes, and wishes for a better tomorrow depend on a free press. At Voice of America, we bring you the stories that people take risks to see. We connect the world and unite it with truth. At Voice of America, we show you the whole picture. You're watching The Always Red Carpet. My name is Jackson Vungani. Thank you so much for joining us each week right here on Red Carpet. We bring you the latest in... Away from the vibrant capital Nairobi, the northern region of Kenya is dealing with severe drought. This week we are bringing you a special edition of Our Voices, part of Voice of America's recently released documentary, Hunger Voices. We are highlighting the effect of climate change on women and girls. We hear from a woman promoting a solution and encouraging everyone to take action. Join the conversation each week right here on Our Voices. I'm so happy that the president accepted his defeat because he knew very well that he never did good. 
And now he wants to prove to the Liberia that he loved him by accepting it. Because if we don't accept it, we will go back to war. And we don't want to go back there. Um, for me, I feel so much excited about the election and the result because that shows that the librarians wanted a change and they expressed that through their battle papers by going out in mass, in, a, in mass numbers to vote. And then people out there are celebrating. So I myself, I'm happy on that of the Waka achievement. They are saying rescue, rescue team, we pray and hope to see our people be rescued from this city region in Liberia this time. Liberians there reacting to the outcome of their presidential election. Welcome back to Straight Oak Africa. As Liberian President George Weir prepares to leave office after only one term, the new president-elect Joseph Buakai steps into the spotlight after decades of waiting in the wings. What went wrong for one of Africa's most famous presidents and what went right? What do Liberians want for the future of their country? Well, here to help us understand the dynamics at play in the West Africa Nation. I'm joined by journalist Rodney Sear. He's the author of the book Africa's Footballer President about the rise and presidency of George Weir. And also with us is Welma Campbell Mashinini Red. She's a professor at Morgan State University and president of the Liberian Community Association here in the Washington, D.C. area. She joins us today from Monrovia, which is, of course, the capital of Liberia. Um, professor Rodney, welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for joining me here on Straight Talk Africa. Africa. Rodney, I'm going to start out with you only because you and I have spoken about this before. Um, I had you on the show earlier um, and we talked about your book, of course, and, and you wrote about George Weir, um, you know, the, the football player, the politician. You wrote about his personality, his politics. What would you write about George Weir now, after this election and after his concession? Well, I think George Weir started off as a president with a lot of hope. He had came from, come from a grassroots movement, the slums of Gibraltar, and rose to the height of the presidency. I think a lot of Liberians wanted uh, to see a dynamic change, um, a change for hope, as his mantra was at the campaign in 2017. But what they got was somewhere along the line, hope lost its way. And I think a lot of Liberians uh, are disappointed. I think the defining point of Mr. Weir's legacy is the fact that he brought in too many of his own partisans to government, and that alienated a lot of the opposition. And I think that made it almost impossible for him to win this election as much as he was hoping to win it in the first round. Um, it was a very difficult situation for, his, for the opposition in the beginning. People thought that they were not going to make it because they were splintered. But toward the end, somehow, I think it was a matter of six more years. If George Weir has given six more years, we would get jobs. We would get food to feed our families. I think that was the defining moment that changed the tide in this election. And that's why I think Mr. Weir is on the way out. Um, Professor Red, the headlines, of course, around this seem to focus much more on the fact that Weir conceded and a little less on the fact that Bukai prevailed. Um, how significant are these scenes of, of graciousness, of accepting election results, bringing your supporters along in a peaceful manner, especially in a time where there is so much political division around the world and, of course, in a part of the continent where we have seen a string of coup d'etats? Well, um Thank you for um, having me on the program. We are, President George, we are, um, he did the right thing. And frankly, Liberians are really excited about this. Um, he is a, as you said earlier, a celebrity. And if you look next door at Sierra Leone, uh, President Mahdi, Madabio, um was seen to have not done a very good job. He was even accused of rigging the election by observers, international observers. And the result was that he has been sanctioned. He cannot travel to most European countries. He cannot travel to the US. And we are is an international figure. He pretty much grew up in Europe playing football. He has homes in the US. His family, uh, they live between the U.S. and Jamaica. He goes to soccer games, the uh, FIFA games. 
he, his son is playing in the league and he cannot afford any sanctions. And he's not a person who wants trouble. He wants to be free to enjoy what he already knows and understands in the international uh, 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 arena. So I think that was a very uh, strong reason for him to concede. And of course, he's, he doesn't seem to be someone who likes trouble. If he had not, um, the country would have been upside down. A lot of Liberians in the diaspora have said to me, even those who uh, supported other candidates in the first round, many of them have said to me that I'm proud to be a Liberian again. Mm. <laughs> and this has come from both older and younger Liberians in the diaspora. And they're, they're proud to be Liberians because we are showing not just the resilience of the Liberian people, Liberians, um, they understand the dynamics. They understand what they need to do to get their country going again. Um, Professor, it's such a wonderful example, um, not just for the continent, but for the world. Um, Africa is always labeled as a place where presidents do not want to give up power. And I, I, perhaps George Weah understood that too, that there's a message that is beyond him and, and his future too, um, but also um, how the country is seen on, on the global stage. I would gather, um, Rodney, we talked about this before, just as pr the professor mentioned about his celebrity status and we talked about presidents who were famous before they came to office. Um, as you know, I'm from South Africa. We had Nelson Mandela. But th later on, there were questions about the economic legacy see that he left behind. Is there a message here about being a celebrity as a qualifying factor when it comes to the presidency, to running a country effectively and being able to tackle very serious economic and other challenges? And that's a defining moment for President Weir because what this election has proven is that the mm -hmm. likes of Messi, Ronaldo, maybe a noble zone for presidency anywhere in the world. I think Mr. Weir has shown that you have to know something about politics, about presidency, about people most especially. I think the people around President Weir betrayed him because they didn't advise him properly. And he didn't have the right advisor to really show him the way, to really guide him. I think there were a lot of red flags in the beginning, in the middle, and toward the end that were not picked up by his support, by his, by his aides. And I'm not sure that whether they refuse to pick it up or they just ignore the red flags, but these are things and signs that show that you have to understand people's lives. You have to understand what they want. And these are things that were lacking in the last six years. I think he tried his best to do some road constructions around the country, to do some construction around the city, but there was just not enough. It didn't cross the, it didn't cross the aisle to other parties, to other people besides those who were part of his party. I think that was the reason why we're seeing what's happening with these elections. I think Mr. Weir will have to go back to the drawing board if he intends to come back to politics and really dig deep in what was missing in these last six years. And what was missing was the fact that people were ignored. They felt ignored. They felt like they were forgotten. And they just wanted the government to feel their pains. And I don't think Mr. Weir did a good job in terms of dancing, booga dance in the middle of crisis, in terms of singing reggae music in the, in the middle of crisis, in terms of playing football in the middle of crisis. Those were things that alienated a lot of voters in this election. And I think that's why they gave him the red flag this time. And, and um, a Professor, uh there is this question of age as well. Um, it's, of course, a topic of concern, not just in, in many African countries, but also the United States, um, about whether age can be a disqualifying factor when it comes to the presidency and that ability to connect with younger voters. President-elect Bokai is 78 years old. The median age in Liberia um, is around 18 years, if I'm correct. Um, but that did not seem to be a political liability for the president-elect, did it? I mean, what does this victory tell us about age and how much it matters in politics? Well, um, this was a vote against the uh, economic situation in the country. And I don't think the age, the age factor was used 
politically by all the other um, parties to say that, oh, this man is too old. He sleeps a lot. He, you know, he is not going to make a difference. But a lot of people calculated that uh, Mr. Boykai will do the least harm to the economy. Um, as in as much that uh, the, the situation is very bad in Liberia, only Liberia has the one of the lowest electrification across the world. People in Liberia, only 17% of urban Liberians get electricity and like 3% of rural Liberians have electricity. So people were not looking at age when they went to the ballot box. They talked about it, the politicians tried to use it, but the voters use their senses and say, look, this man is qualified. He is experienced. He has been in government. He's a calm person. He doesn't hold grudges. He tends to be inclusive. If like he and Ellen, the uh, Johnson Sirleaf had a spat. He was her vice president for 12 years and she he said she didn't support him, but he visited her when her son passed away. He went to see her more recently during her birthday, took her flowers, and she actively did not seem to support him at all. So he's someone who doesn't hold grudges. People think he is, of, of, he has a calming um, kind of uh, 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 Mm -hmm. this position and he can bring the country together I think we looked uh, most people who voted looked at that and um, as I heard once someone say a Nigerian commentator say it's not about whether you're young but whether your ideas are young and, and what the country needs at any specific time um, Rodney we do not have a lot of time so I'm just gonna ask you to kind of give me a yes no answer here George we has reportedly said our time will come again do you think he will run for president again in future well, Arnold Schwarzenegger said, I'll be back. <laughs> I guess Georgia may be back. You never know. And so, of course, I, I take it with enough material now. You will be back, too, with another book. We'll look out for that. Rodney Sia, um, Professor Welma Campbell, Mashinini Red. Many thanks to both of you. I really appreciate your insight and I appreciate your time. And that is where we will leave it for this week. Do be sure to find and follow us on social media. Thanks to the more than 300 television and radio stations across Africa that carry the show every week. And thank you for always watching and for always listening. From all of us here in Washington, take good care. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.